I am going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Good afternoon. Happy Friday, everybody. Good to see you. It is Friday, April 15th, 1 p.m., and I will call this special meeting to order this afternoon. Board members, board colleagues, great to see you. Thanks for joining today, Dr. Stubblefield and staff, and Mr. Goheen. Thanks for joining. And anybody that's watching us today, um, I hope you're having a great afternoon, and thanks for being with us today. Um, as we do at every board meeting, I'll go ahead and read our board norms and protocols. Oh, they just left on me. Where'd they go? As a board, we agree to respect the differences of opinions in making decisions for the district, to follow best practices in managing the superintendent and the management of the board itself, to stay on task when conducting business for the district, including while at board meetings, to never surprise the superintendent or each other when conducting official business of the district, to read these norms at the beginning of each board meeting and at board workshops as a reminder of how to conduct our meetings and to continually self-check to determine if we are following our norms when conducting district business. Um, so with that, Ms. Smith, would you please do a roll call? Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, present. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, present. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, present. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, president. Wanda Brownlee-Page. Wanda Brownlee-Page, present. Rachel Russell. Rachel Russell, present. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, present. Thank you. Awesome, everybody's here, great. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And uh, again, good to see you all, board colleagues. Um, thanks for making time on this Friday. Um, so before we approve the special agenda, um, I would actually move to um, amend the special agenda um, pursuant to staying within um, the noticed um, intent of the meeting to add an executive session for negotiations under the budget as it pertains to the budget. Um, and Mr. Goheen, if I misstated anything, please correct me, um, but I would move to add an executive session for negotiations pursuant to the budget. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Are there questions or discussion? Seeing and hearing none. Ms. Smith, please uh, roll call. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Danny Humphreys. Danny Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Rachel Russell. Rachel Russell, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you, board colleagues. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Um, next, I uh, would entertain a motion to approve the amended special agenda. So move. Second. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Ms. Uh, questions or discussion? Ms. Smith, roll call, please. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Rachel Russell. Rachel Russell, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. Great. Uh, amended agenda has been approved. Thank you. So we'll jump right into our agenda. Um, first on the agenda is a recommendation that the Kansas City Board of Education approve the human resources report and recommendations as submitted and as recommended by Dr. Anna Stubblefield, Superintendent of Schools. So move. Second. second. There's a motion and a second. Questions or discussion? Hearing and seeing none. Um, Ms. Smith, roll call vote, please. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, no. Rachel Russell. Rachel Russell, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, no. And my explanation of vote is that I don't believe the community concerns were taken into consideration. Thank you. I vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the motion carries. Thank you so much. Um, next on our agenda is um, item number three, policy review, um, that the Kansas City recommendation of Kansas City, Kansas Board of Education accept the second read 
of the Student Code of Conduct as submitted by Lisa Garcia Stewart, Director of Student Services, and as recommended by Dr. Anna Stubblefield, Superintendent of Schools. So I know there were uh, um, some questions. So this is up for second read today. Um, I know there were some comments at the last board meeting where we took this on or some questions. And so we wanted to bring this uh, today to just um, allow for some, some time for discussion. If there were any um, questions or um, recommend, recommendations, um, if you had sent those previously to Ms. Garcia Stewart, um, we can discuss those today too, or if you had anything that you wanted to bring up. One, th one item that was brought up at the last board meeting was in regards to the um, code of conduct as it is in the, or I'm sorry, the dress code as it's presented in the code of conduct. And so we wanted to allow space for a conversation on the dress code policy since it is in the code of conduct as well. So um, now would be appropriate if you have thoughts or concerns around the code of conduct in general as it's presented and we'll need a um, or there's a recommendation for us to, to accept as a second read today, but we'll also in the policy in conjunction speak around the dress code policy today as well. Thanks for that clarity, Randy. I didn't know if it was here or the policy part. Um, and so uh, I am uh, bringing forth a recommendation that we as a board adjust our or make some recommendations to the language around um, the dress code policy at this time um, regarding language that is very um, that can lead one to believe that it is targeted towards a certain um, demographic or specific group of individual. Um, so there are pieces of our current policy, um, and I apologize that I don't have official recommendations for language um, substitutions, um, but some of the wording is very uh, most of the wording is very leading and telling to um, those who identify as females um, or those who identify um, as BIPOC individuals based on cultural, um, cultural pieces of clothing or those types of things. And so um, I am asking um, that we provide some direction around supporting um, all students and making sure that our language that we are using in our dress code, but also within the code of conduct um, is inclusive to all individuals and not specifically um, to, a, to a specific uh, gender identity or race. Ms. Russell, did, did you have, I, I don't know if you've got the um, draft dress code up, up there or not, or do you have it available to you? I could share the screen if, if Randy would let me on that. Did you send a different version of it? Was so the one, a different language the one, or? Yeah, the one, the one that's um, on the, on the agenda is the current dress code policy as it exists. Um, in the prior meetings, and I sent an email out earlier uh, that has the one that was the modifications from KASB that we had looked at that we did the first and second read on. So if you're able to pull that up from the email, it's policy JCDB and the code of conduct, the student code of conduct that Ms. Garcia Stewart has um, given you that's up for the second read, it merely incorporates the current dress code. What I was thinking is, even if you don't have specific language, if we could highlight the sections that you think are problematic, and then we can try to take a look at coming up with some alternative language for those, that would help. Mr. Goheen, um, you should be able to share screen if you wanted to. I think any any one of the panelists can, um, I think it's set up that way. So if you if we needed to, just that way. Let me go ahead and just do that. Um, That's all right with everybody. Okay, so that should be, is it showing the right screen? Yes. So do you see the dress code up there? I, I, it's not showing it to me. I'm just looking at a blank screen right now. Yes. Okay. So um, Ms. Russell, if, 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 if it was a go through here, 
if there's sections, what I can do is kind of highlight them. And then even if we don't have specific language today, that at least tells me what you guys are wanting to look at modifying. And then perhaps we could try to work to change that. Or if you think there's additional language that should be added that's not included in here at all, that's fine too. Does that make sense? Yes, I understand. But, but I guess I'm a little confused. This is not, these three or four paragraphs are not the language that is in the code of conduct. Because if I remember, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to operate multiple things on one screen. Sure. When I saw it, the first thing that comes up on the code of conduct is sexually suggestive clothing. Um, yeah. You want okay. to go. Well, this, this, this one does have that. So if you look at the third sentence, it says apparel that is suggest sexually suggestive, promotes violence, illegal activities, drugs, alcohol, or other or tobacco, or is determined to be gang related is prohibited. That's that's language in the dress code. You see, I'm highlighting it right now. Okay. The words offensive um, is, is, I think, dependent on who you're talking to. So those are very, offensive is a very subjective word. So what may be offensive to me may not be offensive to others. Um, I think the sexually suggestive and the some of the language in the current code of conduct that talks about um, straps and all of that, I think that's where my concern comes from. And then language that is subjective, such as the word offensive, uh, depending on all of those things. Yeah. Um, what other words would you suggest that we put in place of those? Because with the way I see it, it's in generalities. And to make sure that the different interpretations by anyone will not be excluded when they see the fact that the students are not dressed in appropriate way. So if you have, if you don't feel comfortable with those words, could you give us a suggestion as to what other words you would submit um i don't and i would, I would open that time. up I, th I i think um i just want to start the, the discussion on i mean even good taste like that's very subjective um decency uh these are all words that are subjective and I understand what you're also saying. Like you're, this is general, but maybe the dress code policy also needs to have um, who gets to determine those things because right now it's all, it's all subjective and depending on what building you're in. So what may be decent in one building is different in another building. And so at some schools, someone could wear a crop top as long as they have a jacket. Um, and others, wearing a crop top is a indecent, it is viewed as an indecent um, item, even if it has a dress coat, even if it has a jacket on top. And so that's where I'm trying to figure out how do we as a board create um, more clarity on what exactly we're saying should be um, behaviors that are dress coded, um, which have punitive um, responses, so. The information here is clear as far as how you want the students to dress. If you change the modifications in each building, you're going to create a problem down the road. So if well, you- that, Well, that's, it's not a problem down the road. That's a problem we have right now is is who gets to determine what good taste is and who does not. Okay, so what I'm hearing you saying is you feel as though what we have here needs to change to meet the expectations and how the students are dressing today and make it appropriate for them to be able to attend school with the style of clothes that are popular right now. Correct. And as a board would we'll have to make a decision that if we follow these guidelines, 
even if the students are in an environment where they are there to learn and not dress, there's a certain way in which they have to be able to present themselves. It's almost like looking at where, where you are with a job. You just can't wear anything to your job. And what we're trying to do is to prepare them for getting ready for getting out in the environment of working and maintaining a certain style of dress. So I would be in favor of leaving it as is and not trying to adapt and address uh, to address it according to how they are dressing right now. If they want to wear those clothing outside of the buildings, that's fine. But I think we need to leave this as is. So I would disagree um, because uh, how people dress professionally today in the workplace looks different. Um, and we talk a lot about adaption and flexibility, um, but then there also are pieces of this that are um, are just, why do we have that as a policy? Um, I think there are plenty of cases of school districts, even here in Kansas, that could make the case that sometimes address, you know, uh, by us saying you have to come to this school and dress this specific way, why? Like, how does that impact the learning experience? Actually, what impacts the learning experience is the fact that they're not able to present who they are in a place where our number one job is education, not to determine whether or not what you have on is decent or good taste or not offensive to me um, versus you. Um, and so I think, you know, I'd be interested to hear what other folks have to say, um, because I think it can be a very different standing, oh, depending on who you're talking to. Mr. Thank Lopez, Ms. Yes, Page. Yes. I, I think I hear what you're saying, Rachel, mm -hmm. but what scares me when it says sexually suggested, I had two sixth graders wear a t-shirt that said, bend over and drive it in. And their mothers didn't think it was sexually suggested. And little boys were hyped and ready. And we had a time trying to convince her, can they wear I love myself or something? But, you know, come on, sixth grade. And they saw it was nothing wrong with it. And we, would, we finally got her to see our point. You, you just can't wear anything. You do have to have a limit. And one of the things we're talking about is children. We're not talking about adults. We're talking about children. And there have to be some guidelines in which they have to operate in, in order to be able to focus their attention on their education and style of dress. It, I just don't believe it's appropriate. I respect what you're saying, Rachel, and it may be able, we may be able to do it later, but I think this is a minor issue that we just need to leave it as is. Can I, can I, can I ask a question? Oh. Oh, um. I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Stokoe. I, I was gonna suggest that we maybe consider um, coming back with an example. I'm looking at a policy where I think part of what Rachel was saying is not necessarily, uh, it's the subjectivity versus um, the other thing. So I'm looking at a different district's policies that says students cannot wear violent language or images, images or language depicting weapons, drugs, or drug paraphernalia, like it explicitly like hate, threat, or bathing suits. It's It takes away that subjectivity of when um, Rachel was saying somebody may deem this as sexually suggest suggested versus not, but you can have language. Um, and I have a clothing that intentionally shows private parts. Um, like it's just more explicit. So it may address, it may not address what you all are talking about, but it may be, it'll take out the subjectivity of what's sexually suggestive from one person to another. And maybe, and I don't know if Rachel has interest or someone or Greg or I can pull and say, here are some examples of district policies that are more explicit. If, and that may help get past the subjectivity part, but the other components that you are discussing, I think are a little different. 
And, and one other thing I would, uh, this is just a, an aside, um, two things I've, I've kind of written down in Rachel's notes. Um, I think that your decisions on the dress code, um, you do probably want some consistency across the different schools, although you might have different dress codes for different mm-hmm. age groups. That's certainly possible. The dress code for elementary school may be very different than what you want for high school, or maybe not. That's This is all board uh, discussion and, and decision ultimately. You do have a dress code policy for your employees that's a little bit different different than, than this. Um, it's policy GAM, if anybody is curious at looking at what that language is. Um, and I did have a question, Rachel, you mentioned you thought it was different in the student code of conduct than it is in the board policy. I do think we want consistency there. So if it, I, don't, I don't have the student code of conduct where I could pull it up and look at it right this second, but um, we would want those to be consistent because you do want the board policy to kind of mirror the um, student code of conduct. Although what you could do is have a board policy that's more general in nature and have the student code of conduct lay out specific examples of what uh, types of um, clothing are considered acceptable under the dress code or what are not. And so that's, I've seen that done as well, almost like as a procedure or guidance for students and families to be able to understand what, what we're talking about in in more general language from the policy. Um, I do think that the decision maker on whether somebody's in violation of the dress code or not is going to have to be the administrator at the building level. I don't know who else it could be. Thank you, Greg. And that, 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 that was a question I had is part of that subjectivity, right? Who's making that decision? So that answered that question for me um, as well. Ms. Clark, I saw you raised your hand. So I wanted to make sure you had an opportunity. Yeah, I raised it and then I put it back down. I think my question was answered. One, I mean, I hear the subjectivity, but I also want to know, like, are we reinforcing the, out of all the things that we have going on in our district, like, what does that look like with if you come to school dressed inappropriately, I think we do a good job of sending kids home or like, what does that look like for our students? More than anything, I just want to mention also the consistency of how that's handled. So we're going to put the time into writing the policy. What's the policy look like? Just making sure that we're consistent across the board with how that's handled. So that, that would probably be a good question for uh, Ms. Garcia Stewart as it, as it relates to the code of conduct, because the violation of the dress code is a violation of a provision of the code of conduct. I believe that generally what happens if somebody's in violation of the dress code is they're simply, the parents are called to ask them to bring some other clothing up so they can change, but I don't know if that's. Accurate. And I can go back to the photo concept, but you're right. I just wanted to make sure we're more than anything consistent because I know there were some middle schools and I know this is middle. They didn't allow holes in the jeans. Some schools did. And so there's just a lot of inconsistency as well that has taken place building to building. And I think it is important to get some consistency across the district on that. And that does go to the objectivity. What you want is objective criteria that that somebody has to exercise discretion to decide whether that objective criteria is met in any particular situation. I think that has to be your building level supervisors, your administrators, they have to be the ones to do that. But it's up to the board and upper level administration to come up with objective criteria that that those administrators can can look at and understand this is what we want the consistency to be across the board as it relates to the dress code. Okay. So, um, and and I don't want to cut off any conversation. I mean, if there's more, more questions or more concerns, I'm, you know, having hearing, hearing the conversation, I wonder what, I guess I have a, a timing question, you know, I know we've got to get this uh, ready for for the coming school year. Um, you know, what's what's our timing on getting this? And, and just thinking about Dr. Stubblefield's suggestion of maybe pushing pause on um, approving a second read for now, and maybe getting some examples of um, other dress code policies to insert into the the code of conduct that maybe we could bring back at the. Um, next board meeting on the 26th. And if there's, you know, uh, one or two um, board members that want to, you know, um, have some input, well, I, any board member that wants to have some input, but if Dr. Stubblefield shares that with, with us, maybe we can work through that over the next couple of weeks. Um, that, that way we're not rushing the conversation and feeling like we need to approve something that maybe we're not all on board with. Um, uh, right now, or maybe that there might be some some 
questions that we have, but um, or could we could we approve the second read and still continue to, to look at the code of conduct or the dress code? I keep saying code of conduct, I'm sorry. Look at the dress code and make, make changes or adaptions if we wanted to um, and bring that back before the third read. So just a couple of options. And I guess it just depends on timing too. And Greg, if you have any thoughts or suggestions on what that. Yeah, I mean, your issue, your, issue, your issue is timing as it relates to the student handbook and the student code of conduct. Um, but you've got to, if, if the dress code is going to get modified and be part of that, then you do need to do that ahead of the student code of conduct. You could, I mean, you can always modify later, but if you're going to publish something out and then change it, that's going to be hard for parents um, and administrators and teachers to follow if you're if you're changing it and they got one document that has, says one thing and another document that says something else, you really need them to say the same thing. So could we can do I ask a different, can, can the student code of conduct and I, my computer is being weird instead of specifically saying what it is, can it say dress code violation? That way, if the board up and Ms. Garcia Stewart, I don't have it in front of me. I don't know how it will change the language, but that way, whether the board updates it or, it stays the same, it will always be in according to, or will that cause confusion? If you just say dress code, um, dress code according to board policy. I'm, and I can't open it right now, but. Uh, if I could just, uh, I, I don't have the one that you just showed, Greg, the policy that's in the code of conduct to, um, it was the current policy that I got off the board docs. So I don't have the most revised one that you just showed. The policy that's in the code of conduct is the most recent one I got from board docs. So what I was asking um, Ms. Garcia Stewart, if it could just generically say uh, dress code violation according to the policy versus sexually suggest, like do you have to spell it out or can you just refer to the policy? I, I can, if that's what the board approves, I can put that and then reference the policy until it's uh, the language has changed. Yes. I have a question. When is it going to print? What's the due date? What's the latest day for it to go? Because I don't think you want to leave it up. I, I think mm -hmm. some things need to be clear. So there's no misunderstanding. So I think the issue is when is the print? When is the code of conduct going to print? So my current timeline, if by the fourth read it's approved on the May 11th board meeting, then that'll allow it to be printed and completed by July 15th. Anything beyond the 11th will take us into the end of July, 1st of August. Well, can we try for the next meeting to have the language ready for approval? So that way she still has time to get it in. Because I think if it's clear, don't leave things open because then Again, that's somebody's interpretation. They haven't seen it. I didn't know it. So if it's printed, it's there, it's clear. Thank you, Ms. Page. Ms. Humphreys, I saw your hand up. Um, I would like to approve this for the second read, but then ask Dr. Stubblefield and Greg to bring back some new language after they look at some other policies from other districts. And we can always adjust it on the third read. I second it. I think that, let me throw one thing in here. And, and this, that is just, I'm fine if you guys do that. That, that's, that makes total sense in, in one step because it's moving the ball down the, down the road a little bit. But um, in trying to come up with some additional language, I want to make sure that the board has an opportunity to look at that additional language and to sort of vet it because... Um, you know, I don't want to, it's, it's not my policy. It's your guys' policy at the end of the day. So I want to make sure it actually is what you guys want as a board. And if you guys have suggestions and language or concerns that are specific, like it's helpful for Rachel to point out, Hey, these are the areas of concern I've got. Cause that highlights what we need to go look at to try and come up with additional or, or modified language. So if there's other areas that are concerned, um, it would be helpful to know that now rather than later. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Mr. Goheen. Um, just, I just want to quickly clarify. I just want to make sure that that was a, I heard Ms. Drew second it. Ms. Humphreys, that was a motion you were making? Yeah, it's a motion. Okay, okay. I, just, I just want to I'm be sorry. clear. 
<laughs> yeah, I, 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 I moved that we approved the second okay. read and asked for uh, Dr. Stubblefield and Greg to bring back some other alternative language to, to share with the board. Okay, no, thank, thank you. I just want to make sure for, for yeah. <laughs> the, the, the minutes that we were clear on that. So thank you. And All I know right. Ms. True seconded that. Dr. Wayne, I see your hand up. Right. Um, you know, we have two meetings before May 11th. So we could easily pause and I wouldn't just have Dr. Stubblefield and, and Greg, right. since Rachel raised some of the concerns, mm -hmm. you would have anybody else, um, but especially Rachel to, to find some other language too. So um, in an effort, in a, in a, and you know, I'm gonna vote against your motion because we still have the 26th and we have the 10th, that's the drop dead date. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Ms. Russell. And I was just going to add, I just also believe that oftentimes when things come to us third read, they are just put on the consent agenda um, for approval and not necessarily for additional discussion. And Greg, please correct me if I'm wrong, but that is typically what I have seen take place. And I just want to make sure that it that is not something that happens. Um, but I also am interested, and I know we're trying to move this conversation forward, and um, how do we no longer require uniforms at the few buildings where we are currently requiring uniforms? Um, is there anyone that can provide a historical context of why we have limited um, buildings that require uniforms and why that is still the thing? Um, I don't know if I know the historical context. I know that the board has done that in a few uh, buildings in the past. And I think there might still be a couple that that's the case. Uh, the board would set that criteria as to whether you're going to allow or permit that to continue or not. Um, but I, I don't know the details of why that decision was made at the time or why it's, why it's in effect. You, you certainly can require uniforms if you wanted to require uniforms. So it is something that... Um, some schools have done with uh, the approval of the board. So ultimately, if you wanted to change or depart from that, that would be a board decision as well. There might be a, there might be a policy on uniforms too. I can't remember. That's There's a policy on up. uniforms, but there is no understanding of why those specific schools we require them. And sorry, Ms. Humphrey, sorry. No, now that started back in the 90s when we were doing the first things first school reform. And some of the schools felt that um, uniforms gave a more level learning environment. And there's a lot of different studies that show one way or the other. Many of our schools discontinued them. They came to the, to the board and asked to discontinue them. A few of them surveyed their parents and parents wanted to continue with it. So there is a process, or we've had a process in the past about whether we approve them or not. Thank you, Ms. Drew. And just for reference, when we do have the third read, if there are any questions or concerns that board members have, it will come up. But most of the time it was approved because no one had any concerns. So that's why the third read went through. Yeah, I, that's a good point. So if, if there are if there are issues that are brought up and we're making substantial changes between the second and the third read, it certainly would not go on a consent agenda or it should not. It should be back up for discussion in an actual mm -hmm. vote and possibly a fourth read if there are changes made after that follow-up discussion. Um, but um, if there are no comments, in other words, We've, we've had a policy that was proposed for first read. There were no comments, no suggested changes between first and second read, no comments or changes between second and third read, then yeah, that's something that could go on the consent agenda. Um, this is different because there obviously are concerns and changes in discussion that's taken place. And it's anticipated there will be modified language between now and the, and the, the next read. So everybody needs a chance to look at what that proposed modified language is and have a discussion about it as opposed to something that you've read, everybody sort of agreed to, and you're, there, aren't, there aren't anticipated to be any additional changes. So this is different, if that helps, Ms. Russell. 
Yes. And Randy, that is all of my questions. I will say um, that I would like to participate in that conversation, as well as I would like to do some, if we could do some outreach to the uh, handful of schools that have uniforms, and if we can, in conjunction with the dress code policy update, um, determine whether or not we need to continue with um, uniforms. Uh, I think those two things go hand in hand. And so I think that just one good, big, clean sweep and I'd be fine. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Thank you, board members, for the conversation. Again, I don't want to cut anyone off, but um, just for the purposes of, of moving this forward. So it sounds, uh, again, there's a motion to accept the second read. It's been seconded um, with the intent also to um, have our superintendent and staff and, and board members who have feedback or want to review between now and then um, the next meeting um, to come back with some suggested um, or suggested language for that. So, um, and I just want to be clear, last, I guess, clarification question, Mr. Goheen. So if we do approve for a second read, um, if it does move forward for a second read, that, that, again, that doesn't prohibit changes happening at the next board meeting uh, before it it comes back again for a third read. There, there could be changes made until the board makes the final motion to approve the final version. So if, if, okay. it's, if we bring something back and there's discussion and additional changes that the board wants to make um, or, or wants to recommend being made, then it would not, it, it's not final at that point. You would come back, you would have it be come back for another read after that before it's made final. In other words, what you, what you typically want are two meetings where this, this is the version that we're approving. And then the last meeting is a chance for any final catches or changes to that. So this one would not be anticipated to be ready for final approval at the next meeting. It would just be, we're bringing it back for our additional information. There would likely be an additional read after that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wynn. Um, you're going to have to ask Ms. Humphreys to amend her motion because she did not include any other board members in that uh, search for information. She just said superintendent and, and Mr. Goheen. Thank you, Dr. Wood. I, I will amend it to say with, with input from community and board members. Can you read the whole motion? Okay, let me try to remember now, Leslie. <laughs> well, write it down, Janie. That's what you have pencils oh. for. No. no, I would like to, I move that we approve it for a second read, asking the superintendent, council, and to come back with suggestions for, um, just a second, for, uh, for, for um, how do I say that, corrections? Our suggestions for alter alternative wording and then um, have input from the superintendent, the lawyer, other board members who have brought up concerns today, very valid concerns. And uh, any community people who are watching would like to have input, they could contact, I guess, um, Ms. Leslie or our board member. Okay, Greg, let's wordsmith that. Well, Miss, sorry. <laughs> Hi, Miss, Miss Humphrey. So um, your amended agenda or amended motion is to approve the second read um, with and have super, the superintendent and, and Mr. Goheen or our legal um, with input from board members and community um, to bring back suggestions at the next board meeting. Yes, thank you, Randy. You wordsmith very well for me. Ms. Drew, you're okay with that amendment? I'm sorry. Yes, I second it. Okay, thank you. All right. Ms. Smith, did you did you get that? Or we can work on that if you need to. Yes, I have it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, I will go ahead and ask Ms. Smith to do a roll call vote, please. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew. Yes. Danny Humphreys. Danny Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Rachel Russell. Rachel Russell, yes. Dr. Wynn. To be consistent in what I said about date, I'll vote no. 
Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you for that uh, conversation board and um, make sure you watch your emails um, for um, communication from our leadership team. Thank you. Um, so next on the agenda um, is a conversation on policy, again, just on policies board. We've had a few conversations regarding some policies today. We've got a few um, and, and I'm going to kick it off to, to you, Mr. Goheen, here in just a minute. Um, there are a couple that are specific with our budget that may may or may not impact the budget process. So we did want to um, bring those. I know Mr. Goheen sent an email earlier today, but there's also a third read on some policies um, that were approved in their second read at the February 22nd meeting, I believe it was. So um, we were hoping to get the third read on those policies today and then discuss the other two um, policies that impact the budget. Um, and I do wanna be cognizant of time too, if, if, if we need to push pause um, so that we can get to our budget conversation since that's the, the priority today. Uh, Mr. Goheen, I'll, I'll kick it off to you and just kind of walk us through this portion. Yeah, sure. And so that there's, there's, there's two issues here. One is when I was um, pulling up the dress code because I knew we were gonna be talking about that today. I noted that we had um, not done a third read of either the dress code revised or the other policies that we did on the February 22nd meeting. Um, those are ready for a third read. We could either do that today since you do have policy review as a, a noticed item, or if you prefer to wait and do that at the next regular meeting, we can do that then. But it, I, they have not had a third read. There have been no changes, no suggested revisions to any of those policies that since the second read so that's up to the discretion of the board as to whether you want to do that or not. The second issue, um, in addition to the dress code policy, was there were two policies that were, have been discussed by the board over the course of the last uh, several policy meetings. Uh, that is the one relating to uh, encumbrance, which um, I attached another draft to my email. It's the same version, although I cleaned it up in terms of the uh, formatting from the last uh, meeting that we had on policies, it tracks the Shawnee mission policy on, on limitation of encumbered or unencumbered funds uh, to uh, set a threshold of, I think it was 10%. I'd have to pull it up to make sure I got the right number. Um, because you're having budget discussion items and because if you are going to adopt a policy of that nature, that would go hand in hand with, with you setting the budget. I thought it was important that you have the ability to discuss that policy and see if that is something you really are wanting to do or not as part of the budget process discussion. The other one that um, is similar in nature as it relates to the budget process, um, and it's not formally a policy, in other words, it's not in your policy, um, board policy book, but it is the uh, limitation that the board placed upon um, the purchase of uh, food or meals for staff members at the building or department level uh, during the budget discussions several years ago. Um, and that, that limitation, um, which was by board enactment and it is, a, is in effect a board policy as it relates to what uh, department members or um, building administrators can place in their budget for those items is a, a discussion point that as you're looking at the budget, again, if you're going to maintain that, that restriction, that's, that's part of the, the narrative of the budget discussions. If you're going to depart or change from that, that will require board action separate and apart from the budget approval. So I just wanted those two pieces out there because um, I, I think you guys have to have some discussions about that as part of the, the budget process as to whether you're going to relax the food purchasing requirement, keep it the same, um, because that will impact how you're approving the budget for those, those buildings and departments. And similarly, um, if you're going to have a policy on uh, unencumbered funds and set a threshold there, um, that really should be done as part of this process too, so that you're not at the end of the day imposing a policy that, that isn't in effect when you're adopting your final budget in July. Thank you, Mr. Goheen. So the first, the first piece to that again, um, and 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 again, board, it should be in your email from Mr. Goheen. The third read on policies, and I'll just say them: um, DJE, GAAD, 
GBCE, JCDB, IIA, and JBCB. Those were approved uh, for a second read back in February with no suggested um, questions or comments. Um, we thought we might be able to get those approved for a third read today, but if there's any hesitation or if there are any questions on those, um, then we'll hold off. But if not, um, then we thought we might be able to approve those. Dr. Wynn? You're on mute there, Dr. Wynn. Like, sorry, uh, is GAD child abuse? Is that one you're talking about? Yes, it is. Okay. Does, does our specific um, policy have to include the agreement or the, the law that said Keisha uh, people have to be mandatory uh, reporters? Does that have to go in our specific policy? Or does it stand alone as a law? It, it does stand alone as a law, but, but we are we try to go almost overboard in making clear in our policy that everybody is a mandatory reporter. Um, and we've even got we even we even include in our policy the actual phone number and link for the mandatory reporting place. I could share the screen if you guys want to see it. Um, but we're pretty but the question is, do we have to specifically say Kansas State High School Activity Association board members, officers, and employees, mandatory reporters of child abuse and neglect? No, I don't, I don't think we have to specifically include that. We, we include all of our employees, all of our board members. I don't think we have to include the Keisha folks in addition to that. Do we have any people who are Keisha people? Uh, we... Um, Dr. Stelfoot, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe we have a couple of people who serve um, on, on the board. Acacia board. Um, I yeah. believe they're from some high schools. Well, I know for sure Tammy is on the board and we would typically you have a principal representative and I don't know off the top of my head who that is. Um, but I can get it and send it to the board. But Tammy Romstead is on the board for Acacia. It might be Mary Stewart. Mary Stewart, okay. I can look it up while we are. Well, I don't. I don't really care who it is. My question is, does it have to be? If we do have people on the board, does it have to be identified, specified, in our own policy of child abuse? I, I don't think so. I think. I think. I think we cover it by saying all of our employees are required to report. Period. It doesn't matter what the, what role they're serving in. They have. Okay. To that was my only question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wynn. Are there other questions on those policies? And, and Randy uh, or Mr. Lopez, I would I would point out that um, policy JCDB is the dress code policy. So that one we've already dealt with. The others are the ones you read. So would we include that as a third read today that we would not? So we would just include the other right. policies that I read minus the JCDB. Correct, that, that one is not ready. Okay. Discussion we've had. Thank you. So um, I would move that we approve policies DJE, GAAD, GBCE, IIA, and JBCB for a third read today. Second it been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or comments, discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Ms. Smith, would you please do a roll call? Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Rachel Russell. Rachel Russell, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. Motion carries. Thank you, board. Thank you, Mr. Goheen. Um, so next, so this, the, the next policies, um, again, um, pertaining to the budget um, are the um, food purchase policy um, that was voted upon by the board several years ago. Um, 
again, there's no real policy um, number letter um, associated with that one. Um, and then the encumbrance policy that we currently do not have, but I know this board is, has discussed and, and there's, um, um, uh, we wanted to, to see if it's appropriate for us to take on. So, um, and, and I'm, I, I do wanna, again, going back to the time, I do just wanna make sure that we spend the majority of our time, the, the rest on our budget, um, but we'll take some time on the food policy first and then the encumbrance. So, Mr. Goheen, could you just, um, again, or Dr. Wynn, is, is your hand up or was that from the previous question? My hand's up, but go ahead and have okay. Goheen talk. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. Go, so if you want to just kind of talk through that, um, the yeah. food. Yeah, so, again. And, and again, I think this one is sort of part and parcel of your guys looking at the budget. I, and it, this would this is just up for discussion. You've got nothing in front of you to to address or deal with right now, but there has been a discussion. You do have a limitation uh, that you that the board has set on the uh, dollar amounts and the number of uh, meals or food to be provided to staff at the building or department level um, that was adopted as part of the budgeting process a couple of years ago. That restriction remains in place. So the, so the question is that that's been brought up is, is that something that the board wants to continue as you go forward and look at the budgeting process this year, or is that something that the board wants to modify? Um, and that's, that's the issue. Greg, as it stands now. I have my hand up. Sorry. Oops. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Sorry, we'll go <laughs> back to when and then Ms. Hum Ms. Humphreys, then Ms. Russell. Thank you. For the newer members, the historical background is that there were excessive, um, and I'm calling excessive $1,000 to Panera, um, $1,000 at a WAP to um, um, Subway, um, $6,000 for a two-day event for um, a workshop to Mima's Bakery. And so... Um, I made the case and we decided that two events per year, um, and it was a limitation of $10 per um, faculty, I guess we can call it that staff. Now, whatever year that was, again, for budgetary purposes, um, maybe a lot of bad apples spilled, spoiled the, the barrel, but I would suggest that we increase the um, amount, but not take the cap off. Thank you, Dr. Wynn. Ms. Humphreys and then Ms. Russell. I just wanted to make sure that we all knew what the limitation was. I was thinking it was $10 per staff member. And I thought it was once per year, but Dr. Wynn, you might have a better memory than I do be it twice a year. I believe it was twice. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Humphreys. Ms. Russell? Um, I guess I just was wanting to confirm, I don't have this in front of me. And if not, what is the policy number, letter? Yeah. Where can I find it? It's, it's a motion that was made at a board meeting. It's not a policy. Okay. It's, I mean, it's a policy because it's a board motion that was a, that adopted or, or made that direction as part of the budgeting process. It's not a policy in the sense that it doesn't have a number. It doesn't have a uh, letter in the policy. Uh, so that's so. why you gave me the minutes. Well, that, that's not the right. Those are the minutes for the earlier policies. This is minutes from, um, was it three years ago or two years ago? I can't remember. Three, the three or four. Okay, so my ask, um, Mr. Lopez, is is that um, it would be great if someone could figure out what date and what the actual motion is. Um, I, there seems to be some confusion amongst us, and I just want to make sure that I know what we're talking about um, before moving forward. Um, and while I'm talking, I will just say uh, I would echo the need to to get a meal for $10 a person and get it delivered and to do all of that, um, that can be hard now, nowadays. And so I would support something, um, moving that forward. Um, but then 
just the occurrence of only twice a year, that's once a semester, and that sounds like it doesn't even include summer, maybe it maybe moving that forward. But I also want to know what what we're also trying to establish by by creating these boundaries um, versus just having a food budget and saying this is the food budget and it can't go over this amount for the entire district. So that's just the history that I would like to have, but also know what our in-game goal um, is as well, because a thousand dollar bill for a hundred people and a thousand dollar bill for 10 people can be very different. And so I just want to be clear on that. So thank you. Thanks, Ms. Russell. Um, Ms. Clark, did you have your hand up there? I do have my hand up and Ms. Russell, I'm not saying what you're, what you're asking for is not important. I do want to say, as we start moving into budget season, we see people having to pull a lot of information. And so for me, I'm not really sure that history is as much important. Like when it got implemented, it was before me. I do know that, but I am more concerned about the policy or the, whatever we set for going forward. Like, what does that look like? I do agree that $10, as everyone has said, is not enough. Uh, I strongly agree that appreciation is 100% needed. Um, and so twice a year does not feel, feel right. And so maybe it's even a conversation about appreciation for going forward. If the, if the district wants to put some type of structure around appreciation or what, where exactly budgets are used, because most times they're used in some type of appreciative, of, appreciative facts, fashion, excuse me or in some type of meeting. So for me, it's not really more of the history as long as I understand the framework, but definitely what we need for going forward to make sure our we are taking care of our staff. Agreed. And I'm not saying the history. I just want to know what the actual motion is. Like right now, we don't even know what the actual motion is. And that's what I want to know. Like if we're re- redacting on a motion, I want to know what the motion was word for word versus maybe it was two, maybe it's $10, but it sounds like Miss Wynn may have been the creator of the motion, but yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wynn. Um, I provided some historical background. I did not make a motion, but I did um, suggest that the depreciation the was there with two events a year. The limitation of $10, I already said, you know, these days could be 25. Um, it does not exclude like parent as teachers to have parent groups uh, come in open house for, for families. So the, the rhetoric and the uh, complaints coming to whomever, uh, the newer board members are not founded, well-founded in the history. And so appreciation, it's per school. They, it may, they want to do the Christmas dinner instead of, instead of the, the cookout at the beginning of the year. That's their discretion. So there, there was, there, there are, there's money budgeted in the, um, in their opportunities to show appreciation. But the, 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 you would have thought, and this is the last comment, and then we can discuss it. I'll make a motion. You would have thought we had stock in high V. That trays and trays, I mean, high V's, and we can go back and look at the, the record. I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. So all I'm, I'll make a motion that um, school continue to, let, let me write it down so I, it gets straight. Um, I'll come back, Mr. Go, uh, Mr. Uh, Lopez. Thank you, Dr. Wen. Ms. Drew? You're on mute, Ms. Drew. Thank you. Okay. Just wanted to uh, uh, congratulate Dr. Wen on her comments. I wanted to find out if she had a suggestion of, of how much we should increase rather than the 10. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Drew. And, and as Dr. Wen's kind of working through um, what she's wanting to say next, I would just, I think part of my, my concern or question, I think it's uh, partly what Ms. Clark and Ms. Russell both stated is, you know, especially I think if there are opportunities for for buildings and for the district central office to provide um, support and appreciation, especially after coming out of two years of working through this pandemic, um, I, I you know I am in favor of. I think it makes sense for us to to, to be able to 
have the opportunity to do that, to show appreciation, whether it's through food or uh, again, I think it goes towards culture, building culture, um, district culture. Uh, I'm not saying go out and buy a you know $50 meal every week for, for staff, but I, I do think allowing buildings who know their staff, who can um, maybe get a pulse of, hey, you know, it might be good to, to do a food truck night this, this month um, for our staff to kind of help, um, uh, you know, I, I think we should allow for opportunity to, to, to do that. And, and, um, and, and to Ms. Russell's point, you know, maybe it's setting a, uh, each building has a dollar limit that they can use per month or per year or whatever that looks like, rather than a $10 or a $20 meal per staff twice a year. I think that makes it much more restrictive and difficult to do um, for, for, for our staff. Uh, you know, I just, I remember earlier in the year, um, through a grant that was going to be no money of, of our own from the district, but rather an outside grant that was offering to pay for meals for staff for a training. Uh, but unfortunately they could not take that grant or use that grant for, for that purposes because of that policy or that motion that was in place, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, you know, finding, finding opportunities to be able to, to, to do that for staff, um, I, I, I would be in support of, you know, um, whether it's amending the current policy or, or just you know, maybe even getting suggestions from Dr. Stubblefield of how best we can include that um, in building budgets as well. So, um, but I, I do think, especially in today's, you know, day and age where building that culture and, and that support and, you know, a tray of cookies and, and, and a tray of sandwiches every once in a while for your staff to say thank you. Um, goes a long way. Um, Dr. Wynn. See, that, that is what um, is the challenge. When you all frame like, oh, when we are trying to budget and not, I mean, you're acting like there weren't excessive costs. And so now you're acting like, oh, it's just nice to buy cookies and, and milk and they couldn't do it. That is incorrect. They could do anything they want within the limitations of twice a year, and it did not include parents. It did not include parent events. This was just just staff. So so staff was not re restricted. But but I'll make the motion: twenty five dollars per staff members uh, for two events annually, not limited to parent events. There's a motion on the floor to um, for $25 limit per staff twice a year. Is that correct, Dr. Wynn? That's um, correct. With, okay, twice a year. Um, with Not the limited to for, parent events. Right, with the exception for parent events. I'll second, but can I make a friendly motion to that? Because I didn't realize that if someone gave a grant, to fund something that we couldn't accept it. Uh, that we make sure that if they do get grants or donations from anyone else, that they be allowed to utilize that. I accept it so that it's a not limited to parent events or grant slash donations because they were not limited. And thank you. Thank you. So there's been a, an amended motion and a second, it sounds like. Um, so I'll open it up for questions, comments. And, and I would just, I wonder back to something Ms. Russell said, um, you know, for those of us that weren't on the board back then, um, I wonder if it might be best rather than to move forward with a vote on a motion today, if we could get the exact language of the previous motion and a bit more of that history um, instead of trying to make a vote on, on what's there now. But um, I'll open it up for discussion. Ms. Russell. So Dr. Wynn uh, or any board members, I guess, what's the difference between saying, so in this motion, we're limiting it to $50 per staff member, essentially, okay. um, over a year's time. What's the difference if I was to one day say, hey, I'm going to get my staff all Sonic drinks. That's three or four dollars per person then maybe on another day I'm going to order pizza for the entire staff that's six or seven dollars a person 
during teacher appreciation week, we're going to have a buffet. Maybe that's 20-ish dollars. So right there, that's three opportunities that was less than $40. Are you willing, maybe, or, or would you be open to a discussion of maybe it's not to exceed... Okay. Like it, it's still that budget number piece. So like maybe every budget gets $50 per, per staff member in the building. Dr. Stubblefield to Randy's point, I'd be open to like, because I know some staff move within buildings. And so how does that fit? And so I'm just, I get where you're going with trying to create a baseline of like, we don't want it to be crazy, but without limiting the number of opportunities, as long as it stays underneath this $50. That, limit. And that makes sense. Okay. Because the, at the end of the day, these schools want to build their budgets. And so th they, in the past, have sometimes been very excessive because there was no limit. And so then when you get your payables, They've already spent the money. So you can't say, I don't want to pay that check for $1,000 to Panera. And, and at the same time, I'm talking about us too. You know, we can't then have a, a full spread. <laughs> so what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So um, you want me to, uh, you want to make it a friendly amendment? Well, I was, um, so, and before you... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Russell. Nope, you're fine. I was just going to say, before we make the friendly amendment, it looked like Dr. Stubblefield may have some help that she may be. Oh, I just was going to say, I think help moving forward, because some of the confusion was like as new people came on and different interpretations, I think it got lost. So I think wherever it is, it is in writing so that there's no confusion and um, misinterpretation of it. I do think to establish an amount and per building gives buildings um, a little more flexibility um, to, as um, Ms. Russell was stating. And I do think we do need to, not just buildings, I think departments too, it's X amount, not to exceed X amount of dollars per person um, so that it, there's consistency um, as well. So, and I, I see your hand up, Ms. Humphreys, and I'm just, I'm gonna cut in line in front of you, I'm, I'm sorry, um, really quickly. Just, I, I wonder, Dr. Stubblefield, Mr. Goheen, based on the conversation and feedback and, and Dr. Wynn and, and Ms. Page, I, you know, uh, curious if you would be agreeable to this, um, rather than try to come up with something on, on the fly here at this meeting, based on the conversation, could we allow for legal and Dr. Stubblefield to come back at uh, a future meeting with an actual written policy um, that we could all look at and then work through um, based on the amounts that have been, you know, talked through here and, and the budgets. And that way we can see it, think through it and talk talk further about it. Um, just, just a question, if you'd be agreeable to that, that way we're not having to write a policy on the fly at this meeting. You want Janie, go ahead and answer. Ja yeah, I'm sorry. Ms. Humphrey, she was in line first. <laughs> I've been in the district a long time. We have two family advocacy days a year now. Back when I was young and in the PTA, um, we would, we, they were called parent-teacher conferences, okay? And we had mothers that stayed at home that would feed the teachers during their lunch break. So there was not time for them to go out and there would not be food service that day. So they didn't have access to food. Or if they get, went to a restaurant, it took more than an hour. We don't have that today where we have parents that are have a one parent at home that can do that. So buildings have been feeding their teachers and staff so that they have time to eat during those times. There are other examples. We have a curriculum committee. We have calendar committees. We ask, I realize we're paying them for their extra time, but we ask them to stay after their work hours, usually until their through their dinner time to do this work. And if we're keeping them till six, seven o'clock, what is wrong with that department having sandwiches brought in for them to eat while they're working? That's, I'm just saying, those are some of the things that I've seen over the years of when people get fed. And yes, we did see some high 
payouts to some different places. But most of the time, not always, Dr. Wynn, because I realized we had some that were really high for individual buildings. But a lot of times when you see that on the payables, it's for more than one occasion. They send a total bill and it gets paid. But I realize we need to set a limit and stuff, but we need, I think we need to take more time. And like Randy suggested, have a suggested policy come back with incorporating all the suggestions and requests that we've made today. Well, let's be consistent with what we just did with the dress code. I will not, um, I don't believe we should do that. Let's move things along. Uh, the, it's just a motion. Greg and anybody else comes back with the policy. This is not the policy. This is the language and the and the, the structure of it. So let's be consistent. If you didn't want to delay time on the dress code, don't delay time on this. So I just I've I've accepted a friendly motion. If if Rachel is still is that if that's the case, a fifty dollars per staff not limited to parent events or grants slash donations. That's the motion. That's not the policy. The policy, Greg, has that job. Okay. Um, Dr. Wynn, again, I'm gonna make, just to make sure that Ms. Smith has the correct motion. Okay. Um, okay. Would you please reread that just so we have that sure. for everyone? I move that $50 per staff for, What's, what's the word, Gregory? Food, fun, games, and all that. What's the word? What's with the word? Um, I, think you, I think you could just put um, for, um, per, I, think, I think you could say meals, perhaps. Maybe meals is too broad of a word or too specific. Yeah. I think, I think you may want to buy somebody flowers. Yeah. It, but let's, I, okay, let's just say meals. $50 for staff for meals, not limited to parent events or grant donations. And this applies, oh, let's say, and applies to all departments. $50 per staff for meals, not limited to parent events or grants slash donations and applies to all departments. Thank you, That's Dr. Wynn. just the motion, this, not the policy. Thank you, yep. thank you Dr. Wynn. But uh, Ms. Page, are you in agreement okay. with that? Because I think that was amended or changed a bit. Yeah, I accept Okay, that. thank you. Um, so there's motion and a second on the floor. Um, and we will, um, I'll ask Ms. Smith to call the vote. Thank you. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark. I'm gonna, I, I do agree we need some type of budget. I'm gonna vote no for today. I, I think there should be some further discussion before before the before the motion. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew. And I agree there should be discussion. I'm going to vote no. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, no. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, um, for the same purposes, I'd like to see an actual policy come um, before the board that we could review. Um, I appreciate the intent though to increase and to help support um, and the clarification from Dr. Wynn um, in terms of why this was put in place, but um, I'll vote no. Wanda Brownlee Page. I'll vote yes. Rachel Russell. I'm going to vote yes, because I, I believe that um, the amount of time it will take us to create a policy um, and to have that go through all of the read process will be much longer than allowing our staff the opportunity tomorrow or next week or whenever to um, be able to benefit from having the increased cost, as well as um, also recognizing that um, this is a motion and that the policy will be forthcoming um, after the motion um, once the small group gets together. So Rachel Russell, yes. Dr. Wynn? Uh, Dr. Wynn, yes, uh, we are consistently, um, one, one would think that we would be consistent in our um, policy making, but um, pass it, I vote yes, so that 
departments can start building their budget. That's what we're here for. We don't have a lot of time, but I vote yes. Thank you. Uh -huh, thank you. Thank you all. Um, the motion does not um, pass. Thank you. Um, Mr. I would um, I would ask Mr. Goheen, I don't think it requires a motion, but um, to come back at the next policy conversation um, to work with Dr. Stubblefield um, and bring us a an actual policy that we could review um, for this for the food the meals, I guess. Um, I don't know how it's worded. Celebrations. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we put something together. I, I do think that you guys do, do need to act on whatever you're doing fairly quickly so that your departments can budget properly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In other words, I would try to go ahead and put it on the next agenda. Yes, yes. And I just want to be clear, and I'm not a ward guru, but when we're saying meals, we're talking, of, are we encompass, encompassing like T-shirts and food and swag or are we speaking specifically to just meals so if there's clarity in that in this policy because I think that's part of the language that has gotten lost is there's this feeling that we can only spend ten dollars twice a month on anything we do for staff so just want to I know we said meals and we were trying to find a different word, but if that is a part of this conversation, I want to make sure that that's clear in the upcoming policy as well. And I do have, and I can put it in the end of the week update, a copy of what actually went out to staff in 2018. Somebody just forwarded it to me on <laughs> October 10th. <laughs> if that will help people, um, and it, it says one food purchase per school year for staff utilizing district funds, just at a high level. It could have got lost in translation, but that is where it came from. I'll attach it today so you can see. Thank you, Dr. Stubblefield. So just to move the conversation along, and thank you for the clarification, Ms. Russell, because that actually is a, a broader conversation. Um, I, I, I will, Ms. Smith, will you please um, put this on our parking lot for the next um board meeting as something to follow up on and that that needs to be discussed because uh, as Mr. Goheen stated, definitely could impact budgets as we move forward. So um, thank you. Dr. Wynn. Uh, just to respond to Ms. Russell, you know, sometimes, um, and it's, it's whatever we want to do, recognizing that school budgets could become limited. Um, and that, like you said before, education is the the main goal of the students, but that sometimes they, they put in for like maybe t-shirts. So that should be separate. Or um, I don't know if, if schools have bereavement funds so that if, if family members um, have those, those concerns, there is a, a fund. Um, now, usually like a bereavement fund would be from donations. You know, everybody put in five dollars for that, but um, it was it was just dealing with meals because it was it was so excessive. And and again, um, I have the records. Uh, we have we have payables that are archived. So, folks, <laughs> folks, I can verify what I'm saying. Thank you, Doctor Wynn. Okay. Um, Thank you board for that conversation. I think um, that's one that we've been trying to have. And so I appreciate everyone's input, um, questions, and we will continue to follow up with that conversation um, at the next meeting. Um, the next item and, and uh, Mr. Goheen, maybe we may not have time to get into a full conversation, although it, I know it pertains to the budget, but it, so we'll, we'll see how far we can get with it. Um, around the, um, we currently do not have a policy on encumbering funds. I know that's something that this board has requested to get more information on and whether that's something that we would like to see or not. It does impact how the budget would then be um, developed. So it, um something we should have a conversation on. So I know Mr. Goheen, you've shared with us um, previously at, at least a couple of times, different examples, Shawnee Mission, 
a school district does have one. Um, so just opening that up, um, I'll let you kind of kick off if there's any further information, correction you'll need from us. Um, otherwise, I'll open it up to the board for comments or questions. Yeah, so um, we've talked about this a couple different times. I, I have no pride and authorship of the, of the draft that we have in front of you guys. Um, uh, it's just an example. It's what it is basically what Shawnee Mission has. Shawnee Mission is the only Kansas school district I'm aware of that has adopted a policy on this. All of this came out of the uh, legislative post audit report from a couple of years ago, suggesting that it would, uh, that the districts should have a uh, contingency reserve fund balance target or uh, goal in place, uh, essentially setting that number. Shawnee Mission sets it between 10 and 15%. Um, the other part of the Shawnee Mission policy that I've, I've got up in front of you is, is uh, DBB. They also place a limit on how much or what percentage of capital outlay dollars uh, can be uh, assigned to custodial or maintenance salaries. Uh, that's a mechanism that school districts uh, can use to utilize some capital outlay funds for some uh, salary costs of certain types if they're associated with building improvements or upkeep. Um, but that is always a, a bit of a tenuous thing and um, it's not a good idea to have a lot of salaries on a permanent basis in that capital outlay because it does have a bit of a, a question mark by it from a budgeting standpoint. The state board and the KSD has always said it's okay to do that. There's guidance out there that says it's okay, but it is a little bit, um, you want to be a little cautious with it and don't want to have all of your, your maintenance salaries dumped into capital outlay because that's not really accurate from a budgeting standpoint. So, those are the two provisions that Shawnee Mission has in theirs. I, I like I said, I just um, pirated their policy and, and offered up as an example or proposal that you guys could adopt if this is something you want to do. Um, you're not required to do it, uh, but it does have a, a recommendation from that post audit report as a best practice. Uh, and it used to be years and years ago that there was an actual requirement that you have a certain percentage, and I believe it was 10% at the time. Um, so it's it's a budgeting tool. If you're going to do that, though, then, then have that in place as a policy. I just figured that you probably wanted to be talking about it now as you're doing the budget process and not trying to deal with this after you've already got a budget in place. So that's why I brought it back up. Thank you, Mr. Goheen. Dr. Stubblefield? I think, and what may be helpful, Board, as you're making this decision, Tracy, can you tell us um, what percentage we currently have in contingency, just so the board will have an idea if the past practice was 10% where we are, so that if we're trying to get there, what the difference in percentages? Um, well, let me look that up really quick, and I'll get right back to you. Okay, thank you. I think, Board, that'll just be helpful as you make that decision because it will, as we are building the budget, we would have to make sure we are making the necessary adjustments if we're not at the uh, desired percentage and have a plan to get there either all at once or over a course of some years. Dr. Stubblefield or Greg, what do most boards do? I mean, what do most districts do? Well, so the, the problem is a lot of districts, frankly, did not manage their money uh, very well. And so they don't have um, the report that came out from the legislative post audit um, showed a lot of districts didn't have anything set aside as this contingency reserve. And the issue is, and this actually happened at 500 a few years ago, what, what that money is really there for are, well, one, emergencies that might crop up. You have a, something that, that's you know, think about it like the money you set aside in case you have a fire at your house, right? Mm -hmm. But the other issue really is to cover payroll or other payables in a given month because you get money from the state. You don't get all of your budgeted money from the state August. You get that over the course of the year. And so effectively, and Tracy can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, I think at 10% or somewhere in that range, you're basically covering one payroll. For the district. Um, so you, you, if you don't have the money on hand, 
then you can't make payroll if you don't have that those dollars set aside. That's really what you're doing is you're really setting aside X amount of money so that you can responsibly cover or pay for expenses while you're pending or waiting for the next payment that may come in from the state. And that's that's really kind of what you're talking about here. And that's why this number floats around 10 to 15%. And again, Tracy can correct me if I'm wrong on the, on the dollars, but it, that kind of it covers payroll and some other expenses on in a given, given uh, month period. Right. That is correct. And I would also ask, um, you know, what, what funds we would be including to come up with that percentage, because, you know, if we're going to say 10%, we would probably need to specify if it is general fund supplemental, because we wouldn't want to include gifts and grants. And so that kind of muddies the waters a little bit on a percentage of what, like if it's just our operating funds, then that would take out federal dollars, gifts and grants, special education, things like that. So I would need some um, guidance on that as well. The, the way the proposed policy is written, it is based on operating fund. Operating, okay. But you're right. It could it, it could be varied depending upon what the board wants. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks, Greg. Um, any questions oh, or yeah, um, thoughts? Miss Page, no please. Do we have any money set aside now? We do have some now, right? You do. I don't know what the number is, but you do. Can we? That's what Tracy is looking up, and she'll be able oh, to tell okay. shortly. Yeah. Right now, in contingency reserve, we have fourteen million four hundred forty-one thousand three hundred twenty dollars. Okay. You know and what? we're no longer paying any salaries out of that. A couple of years ago, um, the board had decided to pay for some additional counselors out of that, and no salaries are coming out of that any longer. So that will roll over to next year, the $14.4 million. It, Tracy, what percentage is that, just for context? I'm going to look that up. I need to kind of add up the operating funds here really quickly, and I'll get right back to you. Thank you. Other questions, thoughts while Tracy's looking that up. Dr. Wynn, please. And this is a question for Tracy also. Uh, what funds essentially cannot be transferred and uh, have, to, have to stay in this specific um, fund? The contingency reserve can only be transferred um, out of general fund. So, but we would consider our operating cost general fund, supplemental general, um, possibly capital outlay because we could move money you know, in and out of that. So I would say those would be the three main funds we would consider our operating funds. So, so the other question is that then there are no other funds that you can transfer any funds out that you can encumber. <laughs> Um, that you can, okay, there, there'll be a difference between encumbering um, or what we're going to be able to put in contingency reserve. So there are funds um, such as bilingual, you can carry money over to the next year. Um, general fund, you know, has to be completely spent. We can't carry anything over there, but there are funds that can be carried over, um, but cannot be put into contingency reserve to save. So then the question is, Greg, what pol what kind of policy is this? So the, the, this, this policy would be setting um, a targeted amount um, of a percentage set aside as an unencumbered operating fund, contingency reserve, um, and it would be based on that operating fund balance, the way, the way it's currently drafted, uh, and then that would just stick from from year to year that's what you would set that at and you would you would target that number that doesn't mean you couldn't go above or below depending on if you have to spend out of it but the, the whole point would be as part of your by policy what you guys would be doing is restricting and saying as we're doing the budget by board policy we have to have this this uh, uh contingency reserve within this percentage range okay so that the, the key word here is contingency reserve, not setting aside unencumbered general funds. That is correct. The key word is contingency reserve. Ms. Russell. So 
So please correct me if I am wrong, um, but I am trying to circle around to my question and this doesn't come as a surprise, I don't think, because I have talked to Ms. Motley about this. So in the instance of the activity fund account, um, those are funds that school buildings raise dollars from with fundraisers, with many different things. Those accounts carry over a lot of dollars that don't actually go to the kids that are, they're supposed to benefit. And so this encumbering funds would not, this policy would not address the fact that we are carrying over dollars in those accounts that are raised by kids. So for instance, right before COVID, if I had a fundraiser at my school or whomever, had a fundraiser at their school for the third graders, those third graders that raise the dollars never actually see those dollars for whatever reason, but those funds remain in the account. So like, how do we get those dollars moving um, so that it isn't just sitting there and nothing happens with those dollars? Well, your, your school activity funds are governed by some different rules. They're, they're not, um, there's some specific statutes to deal with, with how you handle school activity funds. They would not be part of this um, con contingency reserve. That's not, that's not part of what this process would be. Um, okay. I, I mean, the, the, that's just a separate pocket of money. Now, ultimately, even a student activity fund are school dollars and they could be swept into the general fund if they aren't spent in a certain fashion. But there's a, there's a lot of steps involved in that as I understand it. Uh, but they're, they're supposed to be handled differently. With that is correct. That is correct, Greg. Um, and Ms. Russell, you are correct. This is Jenny Motley. Um, student activity funds are subject to the, the voting of the student group. So typically your student council or any other student group that would be represented I um, mean, that would be completely separate from any uh, budget related funds. I will add, um, I just figured it up. Our con current contingency reserve is 5.6% of our total operating costs. And Tracy, just it, it, am I right that that basically covers a, a payroll? Is that roughly right? Or is it two payrolls? I think I think Brad is here. Brad, do you know what yeah, our that's, payroll is? That's probably about two payrolls worth on average. So, so one month. One month. One month. That, that's payroll only, not utilities, et cetera. Correct. Okay. And Greg, you said Johnny Missions is 10%. Shawnee Mission sets their uh, balance at between 10 and 15. Okay. So they, they put the range so that if it gets above that, it doesn't, you don't keep it in contingency reserve, you put it back in the general. And if it's okay. good that, they, they, they increase to get it back to 10. The 10, the number 10, I believe, comes from the post audit report recommendation. So if we wanted to set ours at 10, we would have to come up with another $14 million, right? Yes. And as Dr. Stubblefield, I think said, or somebody said on this, this call a minute ago, you, you wouldn't have, you could, you could set the policy up so that you didn't do that all in one year. You could say that's, that's our targeted goal. And we're going to, we're going to take care of that over the next three years, five years, whatever you wanted to do. Okay. That, that also allows us a contingency fund if we have a, a um, is it natural disaster or something, a fire or something like that at a school to respond quickly to repair things before they get even worse, correct? Is that where we would pull money from? It's, it is a place you could pull money from for right. that. Okay. Right. But, but Ms. Humphreys, we do have, um, you know, a cash balance that we would be able to use cash at any point in time um, and then work through your guys' process to actually pull it out of contingency reserve. So we have cash to be able to respond to a natural disaster immediately, no matter what you guys um, do with this policy. 
okay, but then we could take that. This would also be a source to help fill that. Yeah. We heard. Emergency, yes. Yeah, okay. What Ms. Kaiser is talking about is there's a difference between cash on hand and, and the, the budgetary pockets that that comes that out of allocate, allocated for. And so you have cash on hand that's that you could spend, but then you'd have to trace it back to the budget document or the budget for spending purposes. So just because I spend it in an emergency, now I got to figure out how to get it back to the budget item that it's supposed to be a part of. Okay. And, and you've got flexibility with this fund that you don't have with some of your other funds that are certainly with an encumbered fund, it's designated for that purpose. And, and you'd have to go through a different process to be able to, to undo that. Okay. Dr. Wynn? You know, whatever percentage we come up with, it just shows that we are being fiscally responsible and trying to look for some type of stability, sustainability in, in, in the budget. Because one, we, we, we can have tornadoes, we can have a, a roof crash in, you know, so, so it's, just, it's just being proactive and not um, stupid. So can I ask a question? Is that, um, Randy or Greg, something the finance committee, like if the board establishes a percentage, is that something that the finance committee, depending on whether it's a year or over several years, work together on to come with proposals to the full board of how to get to whatever the target may be, 10% or whatever the board agrees upon? Is that something that the finance committee would work through or is that sure. something? Sure, absolutely. Could be. Okay. If I might add, and um, <clears throat> I, I went to Grandview right a couple of years before the big uh, financial hit in 09, 010. And I think we were about, started at 9% reserve. When I, and it's Missouri and not Kansas, so it's, it's different. Um, but then it dipped down to about 5% and it was scary because around 3%, the state would get involved at that time. And so then we knew that we had to get out of there right away to get to 6% or so. And then our goal was, and the 6% the that we have sounds, uh, and, and being about a month makes sense because our target was to get to 18%. There were some Missouri districts with 25 and 30% reserves. And I think when I left, uh, it took us about six years to get to about 16%. Never made it to 18, but we felt pretty comfortable when we were around 14 or 15% reserve with a whole different rubric. What, one other thing I would point out is that if you have a low number, I mean, if you, if you don't meet that sort of auditing goal, it can affect your bond rating. And that's why a lot of districts take a look at that is that, you know, if you don't have, if you don't have a contingency set at a certain level, that will impact your bond rating and cause you to have higher rates on your bonds. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any other questions or thoughts around this? So when we budget, we need to consider this in addition to all the other factors to make sure that we spread the money out and take care of all the business that we need to. But I think we need to know this before we start the budget. Should we not where this money is gonna come from or how they break the percentage down yearly? Yeah, I mean, that, I think that's the idea behind having it as a policy rather than just figuring it out every year. Um, okay. The idea is that if you have it set as a policy, then you know that when they're putting the budget proposals together for the board, they are, they've already got a preset amount. The board is directed on an annual basis. We expect the contingency reserve to be between these two percentages. And so when you get the budget items, it will come to you in that capacity. That doesn't mean that the board can't approve a budget that has a number lower than the target, 
because you might have a year when you spend it down for some reason. You have the emergency that happens and you've got to take a couple of years to build it back up to the, the number. But it sets a, a framework by which when you're preparing the budget, this, these dollars are set aside for that contingency reserve and that, that percentage um, doesn't mean you can't touch them, but it does mean that, that that is supposed to be set aside for that purpose. Kind of puts a guardrail in place, for lack of a better word. Okay. And I know we haven't talked about it, but that in, in the same amount of detail, but that's the same thing with setting a limit on how much of salary can be attributed to the capital outlay. It's the same thing. You're putting a guardrail in place that is cautionary, that's not going to cause a red flag from an auditing purpose or something like that. It's just, this is good practice. This is where the guideline ought to be. Staff in preparing budgets knows they can kind of go up to that number, but they can't go below it. Um, and that, that puts you guys in a spot where you've got a, a comfort level in, in terms of what that target ought to be for those items. And that's why Shawnee Mission did it. They did it so they had consistency over time as opposed to every year coming forward and trying to figure it out in the, in the budget process. So Greg, you're, you're saying that if, if we wanted to put a uh, cap of 10 to 12% on our contingency fund, we could say that we wanted to reach that goal over five years or something like that. We don't have to do it all in one year. Correct. No, you, you could set a target and then obviously you're not at the target right now. Um, that would be your planning process as to how do you then get to that target or how do you get to what that stated idea is? Um, you know, that, and that's part of your planning process. And that frankly probably ought to be long range planning as opposed to short term. Uh, <laughs> And this is something that would help you with that long range planning process. But again, it, this, this is something the board decides whether you guys want to have it or not. Um, most districts in Kansas do not have it because frankly, they don't have the, the money to, to, to meet it and they don't want to have a target that they're never going to meet out there as a policy. And most of the districts in Kansas are very small districts too. Correct, which, but, but it's percentage. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have any idea what like Wichita or um, Olathe have set for their not without looking, not without looking at their budget? I don't but know. I, I would find that kind of helpful when we're looking at what we might want our target to be. If we decide to go with a policy. I mean, you have Shawnee Missions, but that's just one larger district. Would it be possible for you to find that out for us before we make any? decision yeah i mean i think all you'd have to do is contact those districts and just ask them what they're what they got their contingency reserves mm -hmm. it's it's all public record information mm -hmm. it's not hard, hard to find i don't, I don't know what it is off the top of my head so maybe yeah, I, I can easily look at their budgets and tell you what percentage they have in contingency reserve um, at this point i don't know if they'll have policies that um, have targets they want to meet but I can sure tell you what is currently in place. I, 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 for one, would find that helpful. I don't know if any other board member would like that information or not. That'd be helpful. Yeah. Other thoughts from other board members, other information that might be helpful. So, Greg, today we, you know, again, just to kind of help us move the conversation, um, I know you sent, you emailed us something to look at. Um, do you need some further direction? Uh, do we need to bring this back at a future board meeting if this is something? It sounds like there's at least interest um, from most board members around this. So, I, I, I mean, take a look at the policy. There's again, there's two issues in the policy. One is setting the capital um, outlay threshold for what salaries can be limited to in that, and the other is the um, operating or the contingency reserve balance. Those don't both both of those they're they're actually independent things. So you don't have to do both if you don't want to. Um, I think the language is pretty good from the Shawnee Mission policy, it's the, the percentage is what matters, right? So um, as I said, I think the legislative post audit was recommending 
I think that's generally what you'll see even in your own audit documents. I think if you if you look at the audit report you get, they'll they'll say there's a recommendation for a certain amount under general auditing principles. Um, but that's what you guys, I mean, the, the language can be modified however you want as well. But really what what if you're going to adopt this, what matters is what's the dollar amount that, or the percentage amount that you guys are going to set. That's what matters because that's what's going to drive staff. And that's what uh, Tracy or whoever's or Brad or whoever's working on your, your budgetary pieces for you need to know as they're putting those together. And you need to rely on their expertise in terms of that as well. Thank you. So board, um, again, you know, we just throw it back out there. I mean, it's, it doesn't sound like there's for sure thoughts on how to move, but what that number might be that percentage um, today, but rather come back with some more information that Ms. Humphreys requested. If there's other thoughts or information um, that you need, please let us know so that we can make sure we bring that back forward to you when we discuss this again. Is it possible, Tracy says she could look at theirs and tell us, can she show us if we said 10%, if we map it out, what does that look like? If we said 14%, what does that look like? Or if it's 18, at least three or four options and what the breakdown could be. And then we can go from there. Sure, absolutely, no problem. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Ms. Page. All right, if there are no further questions or comments on that policy. Okay. Thank you, board. Thank you, Mr. Goheen, for providing that information. Sure. Um, we'll continue with our agenda next. We'll jump into our board discussion. Um, I would actually um, ask that we um, go into executive session first. So I would entertain a motion to um, go into executive session pursuant to negotiations um, to protect the privacy interests under coma. Uh, Mr. Goheen, how long do you think we would? Um. Let, let's let's try 15 minutes and see if that works. Um, I think we could probably get through it in 15. Okay, for 15 minutes, going in at 2.50? Yeah. <laughs> Is there a link for that? Yes, okay. I, I just emailed everybody. I just emailed oh, everybody, okay. all oh. the board members, Dr. Stubblefield, okay. um, Ms. Devin, Mr. Goheen, I just emailed you all the link for the Thank you. exec session. Thank okay. you. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there a motion to for 15 move. minutes? So move. <laughs> Second. Moved and seconded. Miss Smith. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphrey. Janie Humphrey, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Rachel Russell. Rachel Russell, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. Thank you, everybody. Uh, motion to return to open session, please. So, so moved. moved. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Ms. Smith, roll call, please. You're muted. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Rachel Russell. Rachel Russell, yes. Dr. Wynn. All right, thank you. We're back in open session. Uh, move to uh, resume, extend, I'm sorry, move to extend executive session for an additional 15 minutes, going in at 3.09. So, so moved. Second. Okay, seconded. Miss Smith. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. 
Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Payne. Rachel what Rachel Russell. Rachel Russell, yes. Dr. Wynn. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to return to open session, please. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Ms. Smith, roll call. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphrey. Janie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Rachel Russell. Rachel Russell, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. Hey, we are back in open session. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Thank you, board. Um, so I am cognizant of the time, and I know it is Friday. Um, I know we have a presentation that was sent to the board um, regarding our budget board. Hopefully, you've had a chance to review that. Um, I know we do have an upcoming meeting scheduled for May, I believe May 15th. Ms. Smith, correct me if I'm wrong. That's already should be on your calendars for a follow up budget meeting. I do. I don't want to hold you all longer than what we already have held you longer than what we were supposed to today. Um, but I do want to make sure that we have information or if there are some questions, um, burning questions that we need to get through um, today that we give you that space. Um, there's this page. Okay. Um, so board just Again, I just want to make sure everyone knows you have information that was sent to you regarding the needs assessments, the building um, budgets, all of that was emailed to you. If you have any, I know there was some trouble um, for some of us getting on, on there. Um, I know I had a little bit of trouble and had to figure it out to be able to access those. If you have some issues accessing those documents, please reach out to um, Ms. Smith or Dr. Stubblefield and we'll make sure we get you that access. There is a presentation on board docs uh, regarding the budget that you should have all received as well. Um, I know there was some requests for additional information. Um, Dr. Stubblefield did send out an email with some links with some of the information, not all that was requested, but um, at least a start. So just want to make sure everyone knows that information has been sent to you and hopefully you've had a chance to review that. Um, I'll give Dr. Stubblefield a quick chance to to share some some thoughts around the budget, I apologize that that you know, especially to Tracy. I know she's put together a uh, a lot of time and in, in, into this presentation for today. But um, Dr. Stubblefield, any any thoughts on the budget here? Just, I just want clarity around the items that were requested, so the board wants all of, and the links address some of it, but we can go through and gather the other all of that information. Um, the board wants all of that information and do you want it? And if that's yes, do you want it piecemealed or do you want it all together just labeled piecemeal meaning as we get a piece, say this is number one, number two, number three, or whatever, or do you want it all together? I just need clarity on that. Well, I'll respond because I asked for most of it. Um, what I, what Randy, you understand New legislation requires us to go through every school needs assessment. And when you read them, one will say, I need a computer and not Apple TV. And the other will say, I need an instructional aid. So to respond to you, Dr. Stubblefield, one would think that kind of like we have a parking lot that here are the request, but that you building people as well as yourself, you're the only ones that can tell us how those students will go get to, to level three proficiency. And because you all know the students, you know the grades. Now, where I had a problem, I, I think I opened up Arrowhead, the needs assessment used exemplary and advanced. You know, we've got to use the same language. So um, to answer your question, as you get it, you know, I think you, you first thank you for sending the links you, you did because that gave that three year um, budget data. But the challenge for then the next year is, you know, what are you proposing? What, how, how many, you know, how many teachers do we need? How many custodians do we need? That kind of stuff we haven't received. 
So waiting till May is very risky. Yeah. But so that was going to be my question. Do we need a meeting before the May meeting? And I will say, um, based off of those needs assessments, and I haven't gone through all of them, and based off the conversations that I've had um, with the building principals and our departments, one of the things that I've said this year, we don't know what it's like to operate as being fully staffed because we haven't been. And so before we add new positions, we really need to work towards being fully staffed so we can fully evaluate um, how we operate um, fully staffed. So um, as we look at those and those kind of things, we really are, I, we haven't honestly, are not planning to add a bunch of staff because we haven't been fully staffed. So our, instead of adding more positions on and allocating budgets to those positions, we really need to focus on being fully staffed with the positions that were allocated in the previous years because we never, well, I shouldn't say never, the last two years, we have not been fully staffed. So we're evaluating that. That's not to say we won't add um, some staff, but that's been my question back to um, building principals and as the um, IAOs are talking with principals, that's really been our focus. Um, if you were fully staffed, will you be asking for additional people? So that's kind of where we are. But before the next meeting, we can make sure that um, if there are additional staff anywhere that is not, um, you know, where we've made shifts, that we'll have that information. But that's why there's not a lot of new staff or anything on the budget, but we're still navigating through that as well. Yeah, and the point is not so much to add staff, but what does it take to get the kids up to three? That's that's the driver, and you are the only ones that know that. And that then I asked. I know I, I had a couple more. Remember, we will have to have law mandated a, a virtual math program. Is there a cost to that? There's a cost to everything. So there's a cost that we don't have. Do we? Well, we do have a math intervention program and I would have to get with um, Darcy and her team to see. I think when the, uh, we got the original question, if the state was gonna say a specific one, that would be an additional cost. But I do believe that our current, we do currently have a math in intervention, like a online math intervention, but I can confirm with, um, Darcy and her team. Yeah, that I mean, that was the the compromise, but still, I'm sure it comes with the with the cost. And then the the targeted literacy intervention. You already talked about letters. There's is there additional cost? So those are the questions. Just to do the budget, and, I, and I'll guess I'll respond to your first question. It appears that much of that is there, but again, moving to 22, 23, I don't think it's gonna be the same cost. And if you don't have the same people, then there, there may be some savings. And, and I'll, I'll say it again, I don't know if people read my email, you know, in 2023, maybe we can have some savings by cutting some of these vehicles. It may be $50, but, that's, I mean, I'm going, I, I never hide <laughs> my views. So, you know where I'm coming from, from day one. And that's for everybody. Not just you, Dr. Stubblefield. Ms. Russell. Yeah, so I guess I just want to understand a little bit more about what the request from Dr. Stubblefield is um, mainly for a couple of things that Dr. Wynn mentioned um, in her email to us is additional dollars. Um, if there is anywhere in these budgets that dollars can be saved. So are, are most of these increases to the budgets? Are they the same budget? Um, 
specifically based on some of the data that we saw earlier this week. Um, I am concerned about some of the budgets um, and our return on investment on those dollars around some of the areas related to student achievement. Um, and so um, I have questions about specific budgets and what's being requested and yeah, all of that. So is that what you're asking for? But then also recognizing that some of these departments have funds that are coming out of ESSER dollars. Um, and so are those additional places that we can cut cut savings in some of this general operating. And so that comparison analysis of what is current, what has currently not been spent um, out of those budgets, um, if that is a way to cut some of the budgets and save, have some of those cost savings, um, I would be supportive of looking at. Um, additionally, uh, my other question was budget priorities and when does that come into play? Just clarity around um, when does that impact these department budgets that we're looking at um, right now? So. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Um, other questions, board. I, I do, um, I do see, know that Miss um, Miss Smith had sent out a calendar invitation or calendar hold for April twenty seventh for a potential meeting. Um, if we're trying to get another meeting before May fifteenth, um, if that works, and I don't want us to sit here for the next fifteen minutes trying to find a date and time, um, but if you have that date already saved or on your calendar, and if that works for folks, um, that'll give us some time to come back for a budget meeting. So I would. Um, I'll follow up with Ms. Smith if that afternoon works for folks um, and, I, and, and we'll have to get with staff to make sure that it works for staff and, and for the board too. So um, I, I have a question now. Originally, I thought it was school board evaluation. It's not evaluation, it's budget. Well, and, and we hadn't, um, I'm working with Dr. Wiesman on trying to get together the board self-evaluation. We've got another date saved for that as well. So that wasn't confirmed. Uh, Ms. Smith had just put a hold on folks' calendars um, in case we did have that meeting that day. So that's why I'm trying to take advantage of a, of a date that may already be on your calendar. The April 27th is the other date that's held. Yep, April 27th. Mm-hmm. Okay, now can you go back over? I, I thought the twenty seventh was the date you were talking about. What was the other date? In right, April April, April twenty seventh is a potential date that might that should be on your calendar as a hold already. May fifteenth is a date that should be on. No, that's not a right. Sunday. That's not right. Yeah, I'm sorry. May thirteenth. I'm sorry. May thirteenth. It's a Friday for a budget workshop. So if we're trying to get a meeting before that May 13th date, um, I was looking at potentially using that April 27th date. But again, I'll follow up with Ms. Smith. Um, I don't want to keep you all here for another 15 minutes uh, trying to pick does a date. Does it have to be a Friday? Just asking. No, it does not. Well, can we do another date besides Friday, please? Absolutely. Ms. Smith, why don't we work on identifying some dates with Dr. Stubblefield's calendar and, and Ms. Kaiser, and then we'll work with the board to get a date. So we'll do, I'll, I'll connect with you on Monday, Ms. Smith. So if there are no other, Dr. Stubblefield, did you need some more um, direction from us today? Ms. Kaiser, I'm, I apologize that we didn't give you the chance to present today. Um, but uh, thank you for the information board. You do have that, that presentation. So if you have questions, please send those along. If there's nothing else for the go to the order, thank you all for staying late. Everyone have a safe and blessed Easter holiday and weekend. And uh, we'll see you next time. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>